Well, I think, uh, well, first of all, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, pleasure to have everybody here. Today is the, you know, one of my favorite days, actually. <laughs> it's the pituitary day with Dr. Sanson, uh, Dr. Q, uh, Dr. Chai Chana, and, uh, you know, all the team here. So good morning, everybody. And uh, today we're going to have Andrea uh, Otamendi and uh, Carlos uh, Perez uh, presenting. So Andrea, want to go ahead and start? Sure. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yeah. OK, thank you. So um, OK, I'm going to present a case of, of Dr. Chaichana's case and JP's case uh, with Dr. Donaldson. So first, I would like to acknowledge uh, everybody, everyone involved in this case for their help and, and guidance on putting this presentation together. So this is a 48-year-old right-handed male with a history of pituitary uh, resection in 2016 at another hospital who presented uh, for evaluation and management of a recurrent uh, pituitary tumor. In 2016, he was in his usual state of health when he noticed uh, right hemifield loss in his right eye. Then he underwent imaging, which revealed a pituitary mass, and then the patient had a, a resection for optic ISM decompression. So the patient has been seen by ophthalmologist annually, and more recently, he underwent visual. Uh, field uh, testing, and he noticed uh, also he, the patient uh, complained about decrease of the visual fields in his right eye. So he came to us. His past medical history includes uh, sleep apnea and hypertension under treatment and history of DBT. Um, and the patient uh, didn't uh, had. Um, uh, postoperative uh, pituitary insufficiency the last time, but um, he uh, has hypogonadism and he's with, uh, currently on testosterone replacement. So his physical examination, um, he, the, the cranial nerves were grossly intact and the visual fields were full to confrontation. The ocular motility and perimetry were intact. So this is, uh, I'm sorry about the uh, quality of this test. It was a picture uploaded to the system, but uh, this is a non-harm free type exam standard technique. And here we have the right eye where we can see the visual uh, field with the standard technique, the no fixation loss, uh, the with minimum uh, false negative, and uh, here it's suggesting a bitemporal aminopsia. I don't know if Dr. Egenberger is on the, were able to join. Um, yeah, and, so when we looked at this, he's, this is a field from outside. Yes. And it's, uh, it's not a Humphrey field. It's actually a, a small field. It's almost like an Oculus, like a virtual reality machine. And so it's not a, a field we have a, a lot of experience with. It's a newer technology, but this does seem to show a temporal defect in the right eye. Thank you so much, Dr. Regenberger. So uh, for the preoperative labs, uh, Dr. Patel. Yeah, so the patient had um, normal TSH, normal T free T4, AM cortisol was 13, so that was also within an appropriate range with an ACTH of 52. Um, he did do a 24-hour urine cortisol because he was complaining of like weight gain, and he's a nighttime pediatric ICU nurse, so his sleep-wake cycle was a, a little bit off, so it was hard to do like salivary cortisols for him. Um, but he didn't really look cushing weight on at least the virtual exam that we did. Um, his IGF-1 was 29, prolactin was 13.4, and we don't have his labs from prior to him starting testosterone, but he did have some other reasons that he could have 
hypothalamic hypogonadism, which would include like sleep apnea if he wasn't using his CPAP all the time. And then um, also, um, bes besides being a pituitary tumor, I mean, and then also um, him being overweight as well. So we weren't sure exactly what those labs were prior to him starting, but we did see a testosterone of 188. Thank you, Dr. Patel. So here uh, for the preparative uh, images, these were uh, from outside as well. And we have a coronal um, cut uh, of a T1 a weighted image uh, with a contrast in a T2. And we, we can see here a uh, left-sided uh, heterogeneously enhancing lesion here. Uh, of the pituitary, which um, looks, like, I mean, looks like a microadenoma, and it is placed in the infundibulum uh, towards the right side of the floor of the cell, and it doesn't really look like uh, it's inviting the uh, cavernous sinus. Here, yeah, um, uh, Andrea, if you the, don't mind me. If you don't mind me interrupting, I'm sorry. I wonder if yes. you have uh, one of the radiologists on the on the line as well, and if anybody would like to comment. Yes, Dr. Murray. Oh, perfect. Yes. Um, kind of, so I totally agree with what Andrea just said. It looks like a recurrent adenoma. It had grown a little bit. There was another prior earlier to this. One of the things I, I wonder about, and I'd like to get you guys input, so how important so in this case, there's been a, quite a few papers. I forwarded one in the neurosurgery literature to on Andrea discussing how we can predict if there's cavernous sinus invasion or not. And bottom line, we're not great um, at it. They're beautiful. So, <laughs> but this is kind of um, the approach, and this is what this is what I use. And I'd like to get how important is it? Number one, that we make that call. Thank you, Andrea. And this is how I would kind of, I, I draw these three lines, okay? So you have this line from the superclinoid, cavernous part of the medial line. You have the line that goes straight to the center and then you have the lateral line. And then you also, what I, I have a separate, this, this has been talked about too, kind of this 3B area. I call the area below, in, below the cavernous uh, carotid artery, kind of the cavernous sinus. Um, and that area, if it gets below that, is very suspicious, especially if it crosses to the lateral margin below the cavernous carotid. But if it's the kind of the way I approach it, if it is, if it's a zero, then I don't, then it's a definite, it's not invading the cavernous sinus. If it's a one, it is unlikely to be invading the cavernous sinus. If it's a two, often these don't invade the cavernous sinus, but they can. So I, I kind of approach that as a it's a possible which i think ours was a two if i were to grade what we just saw i would have graded that a two on the on the nops uh, classification which often is not but but possible now if i get usually when i kind of say i'm suspicious that there is cavernous sinus invasion is when i get a three so when it has violated that lateral margin of the superclinoid to the cavernous carotid and if it goes below the cavernous carotid and what I call the carotid sinus. And then there's the four, which, you know, that's a hard call. And it's basically just encasing the carotid and it's completely filling the cavernous sinus. And that's an easy call. So that's kind of the approach and it's kind of supported. It's been multiple, this is a good paper. There's multiple papers yes, uh, supporting that approach. But I, I'm wondering sometimes when I do that, is it, is it helpful to you guys, the neurosurgeons? In your yeah, I mean, thanks Dr. Murray. Um, and, um, you know, very good comment. So this is the modified GNOSP scale published by Dr. GNOSP group. Um, recently, this is a paper in JNS, and, and Dr. Gnosp classification is the most, uh, you know, widely spread used in, in your surgery literature for invasion of the cavernous sinus for pituitary tumors. So indeed, for us in your surgery, it's it's quite useful. Academically speaking, that's the one that we do use uh, in our papers to divide when we, you know, were to classify those tumors as with cavernous sinus invasion or not. So most of the neurosurgical literature classifies just as what you did from zero to two, uh, you know, 
uh, no invasion of the cavernous sinus, so to say, and three to four with invasion of the cavernous sinus. Although there, you know, of course, there is criticism to this overall approach, but that's how it kind of end up usually doing. The division in 3A and 3B that they did, and as you said, you have mostly, I like to call like a posterior superior space in the cavernous sinus and inferior anterior space in the cavernous sinus divided by the horizontal segment of the cavernous ICA. Uh, in the superior space, which is the one, the 3A, so to say, uh, basically the medial wall is thicker. Uh, and while the 3B, it's often uh, not necessarily like it's thin and, and sometimes even like with small little holes that, uh, in our opinion, justify why it's easier for those tumors to invade into that space and so on and so forth. Once that said, uh, uh, in our a point of view, the one big challenge really those tumors is the four, you know, NOSP4. Those are the ones that really kind of, you know, go around the carotid completely and kind of like tend to sometimes it's extend and infiltrate the lateral wall, the cavernous sinus, which may limit or resection. We do have good techniques to remove 3A and 3B in my point of view as well. Uh, with the caveat, in this specific case, I fully agree that one could classify as a two. When I look at, uh, if Andrea can maybe go back to the previous slide and uh, scroll the images a bit, there is one small point in the image that you can see. I'm, I'm going to show it here in just a second. Yeah, it right there. Stop right there, Andrea. Go back. Yeah. So right here. So okay. this is kind of like the, I'm sorry, this doesn't look like a line, but <laughs> this looks a bit more like a line. And then we got the, those segments here. So this is the supraclinoid segment of the ICA. This is the horizontal segment of the cavernous ICA. And we have this small indentation here. So the presence of this small indentation here makes me think of a cavernous sinus invasion as a 3A. Here, I, I do not see anything in the inferior compartment. This cavernous sinus is clean. And, uh, and then we don't have to worry about it. And uh, here, as Andrea said, this is the tumor that we are dealing with here, mostly a cellar tumor, but uh, in my opinion, with some small component here in the superior compartment. And here, this is the, you know, the pituitary gland, uh, as Andrea had mentioned, the pituitary, the pituitary stock was shifted to the right. Uh, so those are usually the, the points of view that we have. Uh, and of course, in this case, the optic chiasm is not compressed at all whatsoever. So. Um, whatever visual deficit this patient had now, it's likely secondary to the previous operation, previous problems, rather than a current issue. But those are all very important points, absolutely. It does look like it's getting into the superior compartment on that image. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to see that in surgery, it's sometimes it's easy. I mean, not easy. Uh, it's actually not that clear to say when you don't have any wall left. But this case is going to help us to, to you know, look at those compartments as, as Andrea is going to show in the video. Is that inferior compartment tougher for you guys? Uh, surgically, more residual disease down there. <laughs> well, inter yeah, that's the thing. So in my opinion, every time we have a disease extending into this space here, uh, the big problem with it is that uh, we need to uh, pituitary surgery, just like any you know neurosurgery or especially skull based surgery, it requires number one, I think. 60 to 70 percent of it is exposure and to get a really good exposure and maneuverability in this compartment here uh, often we need to do what we call a transterigoid extension of our approach which basically means drilling the top of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone and uh, that allows us to navigate to the inferior and lateral aspect of it after we do that we need to remove all this bone in the inferior part of the cella uh, which uh, with the endoscope, we usually can do that quite easily with removal of the clivus bone and exposing the carotid and exposing that inferior lateral aspect of the sphenoid sinus. The only problem with that is that, uh, well, I would always get a uh, nasal septal flapper. So if we have a, a tumor like this, uh, with the consideration that reconstruction is challenged because you have a 3D bony defect in that area. So long story short, yeah, potentially it's more complex, but uh, it's doable. We just need to adapt the techniques. But I think once you adapt the techniques, you can get that reasonably well. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Ian. Uh, if I can add one comment, me. if I can add one mm -hmm. comment about the imaging, just because we're talking about imaging, one thing that uh, actually I got this from my time at Cleveland Clinic, and I agree with the team there, 
that may be helpful in assessing the you know extension into the cavernous sinus and for the details is when we use a key sequence so i think i teach you high intensity uh to look at uh you know in sag though in coronal to look at that relationship with the uh, cavernous sinus as well there has been some work and i agree on that there's been some work on when you go kind of 3D isotropic high resolution, which a KISS sequence is, or space sequence, similar mm -hmm. sequence, and there's been some literature out there showing that it, that it does add value. So that's yeah. a big point. One more point, um, just for discussion, Dr. Murray, because what he brought up is very important. Uh, so this is the paraclival ICA, or uh, I mean, what we call paraclival ICA, which is nothing but the ascending segment of the cavernous ICA, okay, on the left side here. Uh, every time that uh, we end up seeing a tumor with this relationship here, like getting close to this ascending compartment of uh, ascending segment of the cavernous ICA, every single time I think about the cavernous sinus here. And if we were to look at the sagittal cut, we would see in this tumor here that there was a small component. It's like if, uh, oh, perfect, Andrea. Can you scroll a bit? Yeah. Yes. Let's go the way to where the tumor was more. I just want to show the relationship with the carotid and the cavernous sinus. Very good. You can stop right there. Maybe. And you can see, of course, this is the carotid. Everybody can see that. We have here, this is what I like to call the anterior inferior compartment. And this is the posterior superior compartment divided by the carotid. So in this case, we have to look at this very carefully. Remember, we're going to clean this and we're going to clean this above the superior segment, uh, above the horizontal segment. And we need to inspect posterior to this posterior genome of the cavernous ICA. So this relationship with the with the ascending segment of the carotid, this uh, always speaks to me um, towards potential invasion, although I only saw some invasion in the superior compartment in this case. Please go ahead, Andrea. Thank you. Um, yeah, and here I just wanted to show uh, like uh, the increase in size over time. The previous uh, MRI that we got is from 2019, and the, and the latest one was from 2021. And if you compare uh, two images, you can see how it looks like there is an increase in size. And well, um, the, uh, JP already uh, show the sagittal, but here uh, is a CT, it's a CT scan for surgical planning. And this is important in, in, in for example, here in, in the case of it's a recurrent tumor, uh, there were some changes of a prior, the prior surgery. So the patient had the absence of the bony floor of the cella and the sphenoid septum. So also that's something that I would show on the on the surgery that it was uh, very challenged. So so well we we can say that it's a recurrent pituitary adenoma and. The potential risks for these are uh, for the surgery is the CSF leak, infection, nose bleeds, uh, septal perforation, or vascular injury, endocrine uh, dysfunction, or change in sense of smell. So the treatment options uh, for this patient first, uh, uh, well, the surgery, rather surgery, and in case of uh, that the patient were not uh, having a symptoms that the patient presented as symptomatic, we will offer, have offered as well, uh, observation, uh, serial follow-up. But so we have a patient uh, that is 48 year old with a recurrent pituitary adenoma, macroadenoma with growth of the tumor uh, over time and the complaining of the visual uh, field loss so we offered the endoscopic endonasal transferoidal approach. Oh, just a second, Andrea, okay. before I go on, yes. can you go back to the previous slide? And this is very important, I think, for all of us. Uh, you know, patients with pituitary tumors and Dr. Uh, you know, Dr. Sampson, Dr. Eggenberger can speak uh, way more on behalf of this as well. Uh, they will often come to clinic and they will have some visual changes and they're always gonna be like a questioning of, you know, pituitary tumor, 
or you know any other ophthalmological change like glaucoma, cataract, I mean, especially cataract, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, so on to say to justify the visual change. And uh, quite often, actually, patients with visual change, they end up getting some diagnosis of cataract. And then after some time, they end up getting an MRI and they, oh, actually, this guy has a pituitary tumor causing this as well. So very important to keep that in mind. On this specific case, uh, such a visual change, at least my point of view, cannot be caused by the current recurrence of this tumor. This patient may very much likely have a residual visual change associated with the previous sizable tumor that he likely had, or even secondary to some surgical manipulation at the time of the first surgery in an outside center, but not mm -hmm. because of the current size. So uh, this is just to say that in this case, with this type of configuration, I wouldn't say that we recommended surgery because of visual loss. That, that That's definitely, I think, not the, the approach that, that I would bring, but due to the presence of a, a progressive enlarging pituitary tumor. And in cases Thank like this- Those are great I'm, points. I'm sorry, sorry, Dr. Gimberger, please go ahead. Those are great points. I, I totally agree. And I think we do occasionally see the cataract that gets done and then ultimately the pituitary tumor is discovered. And the, the big issue there is just the, the detail on the exam. It's, it's uh, still surprising that a lot of eye exams are done without perimetry. And so we, we will occasionally see those slide through the cracks. And then the other things to keep in mind, I think, are that a temporal hemianopia can be caused by many things besides chiasmal compression. So we'll see this with other optic neuropathies. We'll even see this with fortuitous retinopathy. So all really good points. And I think that for us in your surgery clinic, one thing that is very important in everybody that we see with a seller supercellar, parcellar type of tumor, even like for other skull-based tumors, is always, always, always have like a Snelling card and check visual acuity, at least that's something we can do ourselves in clinic and also a visual field. So that's, it, it then of course to document that pretty well in the chart, you know, uh, and th that's for all of us in practice that, that helps. Of course, we're blessed to have a fantastic ophthalmology team here and your ophthalmology team working with us. That's not the case everywhere, we all know that. So. Uh, it is important for us to have a chance to to be able to document and to assess that in a progressive fashion. On another topic, I'd like to ask Dr. Sanson as point of view, because I'm going to try to bring up a discussion here. So we have a patient like this with, uh, you know, progressive tumor, uh, tumor growth. Well, I'm a surgeon. I love to do this surgery, so I definitely going to recommend surgery. But uh, let's say that this patient would be 70 years old and no new symptoms, so to say, um, and this patient, you know, I think it could be followed conservatively. Radio surgery, it is indeed growing in terms of uh, potential use and role in some tumors. This is not touching the optic chiasm, so I would feel safe to deliver radio surgery. Not saying that it would be my favorite approach or so, but uh, I just want to bring those points to discussion, have Dr. Sanson's, uh, you know, approach and opinion about all of those different options. Well, I, I think as Dr. Shulis pointed out, the patient still has intact pituitary function and certainly they have gland to the right that's doing that for them while the left side has the tumor and it's enlarging. Over time we get concerned that more compression of the gland could lead to more deficiencies and you know I've had the privilege of working with amazing neurosurgery teams and so to me I think um, sometimes I tend to tilt more toward taking the tumor out before it causes more major problems while the patient is is not in an urgent state of needing to have that done. So in my opinion, um, I saw this patient, or I think Dr. Shulis saw this patient pre-op that, that when you see that enlarging tumor, you know, in two to three years, what will it look like? And you may be going down the pathway of surgery anyway. So um, radio surgery, I don't have as much experience with it. Um, probably more like 20 patients um, in functional tumors. And so um, just not quite knowing from my personal experience with the outcomes would be using that as an approach, but I agree with surgery in this case. Thank you, thank you, appreciate it. I think it's, it's, it's nice to have those perspectives because when we get like in a round table and, and uh, well, Dr. Sensor knows and we all know like sometimes we get up to this discussion, especially like for the non functionings that are not causing precise, you know, symptomatology right now. And I think, and I fully agree with Dr. Sensor, those are the points that I think uh, justify our approach additional to the progressive enlargement imaging. 
So, okay, so maybe let's jump to the video. Okay. All right. So. One important point as Andrea plays the video, uh, I, I, uh, you can play the video, Andrea, but uh, is uh, that this first operation on this patient was done in a very good center, you know, uh, here in the United States. Uh, and uh, you're going to see that they, you know, couldn't get the full tumor out. And then we're going to highlight it. a few of the reasons why we think that was the case. But Okay. Well, um, also, as previously mentioned, uh, when I was showing the CT, there were some changes of uh, because of the prior surgery. So the start is quite different. Uh, but normally, I mean, uh, ENT plays a lidocaine and epinephrine to uh, decrease the, to minimize the blood flow of the sphenopalatine artery. And then um, the, the inferior middle terminus should lat be lateralized. And then uh, the, if the, os the sphenoid ostia should be identified. But here, uh, so the patient here was at uh, the septo plasty and had a bilateral to have bilateral access and then um yeah so basically here what you I'm see is Andrea was saying I'm sorry you okay if I if I just explain Andrea or you'd like to continue uh however you prefer <laughs> <laughs> no I mean just for the sake okay. of time because I want to be respectful with Carlos yes. I'm so sorry for interrupting you but so they did a septoplastic because the patient had a septo deviation. You see here, mm -hmm. Dr. Donaldson working with a, a, a bone a tip, removing the residual septations. And we start to see here on the bottom, uh, the, you know, the, the cell floor. And here we're already with the drill. I'm just skeletonizing and finding the bottom of the floor. And here I'm starting to drill. Uh, you know, the cella uh, itself to kind of try to maximize the exposure. And it's always, 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 once again, quite repetitive. Uh, to me, it's always about finding the optic canal, carotid, clinoid, uh, clinoid carotid, and then to go all the sure. way. Can you stop the video right there? And then to go always, so it's, in this case, the clinoid carotid was here. You can't see because there is some, you see a bone septation here, but the optic canal was going in hidden here behind this uh, septation, the sphenoid sinus. Here we do, they'd open some of the posterior ethmoidal cells, which allowed us to find the clinoid ICA, which in this case would be running here, and the carotid canal would be running here. You see here, uh, this is the so-called classic opening that we would get with endoscopic, but you see that this here was the open that was done by in the previous operation in the outside hospital so when you have this type of small opening at least to me it is quite difficult to get uh, this whole tumor out so what did we have to do once again exposure is the the same thing that uh, is the first thing that would change our approach so additional to the classic whole cell medial wall to medial wall exposure we went all the way to the left side to see the cavernous sign as well, and to see a small segment of the clinoid ICA here. So we could explore uh, at least the medial wall, the cavernous sinus, and uh, the spiral compartment. So please go ahead and drag and play the video, please. Mm. Go back a bit, please. More and more and more. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after the bone is seen out on the left side, we can, uh, you know, easily bone eggshell and remove the bone on the, you know, covering the left cavernous sinus, uh, covering the anterior wall, the left cavernous sinus, then see the clinoid ICA here. And then basically with that exposed, we're going to, you know, I just going to thin out this right side to kind of get that bottom part exposed as well. And with that, we're going to open. So sharp opening of the dura, trying to separate the dura from the capsule or the pseudo capsule of the tumor. Uh, always same maneuvers like to use the round knife. And you see the tumor is quite soft here in this area, while on the right area, because the fibrosis in the gland, we didn't have the same consistency. So we're going to go and fully expose that. Once again, the round knife, that helps us to find the plane, the separation between fibrosis and the gland on the right side. 
and the tumor that was actually located on the left. So this one, I'm gonna go all the way to the carotid. The carotid was here. And then opening that up, getting tumor to you know pathology. So we sent frozen permanent. And then always starting the bulking in the bottom, like using the two suction technique to clean that part. After the bottom part of the tumor was clean, then open the dura a bit more to facilitate the resection. And then we had to direct or clean it towards the cavernous sinus. Why to do that? Because if you clean the mid part and the arachnoid starts falling on you, it's going to be way more difficult to see that. And then here, once we open that, we can start to see the carotid. You're going to see that much better. But this here, that's the carotid in the cavernous sinus. And then we're going to start. You see that I'm mobilizing the carotid, so I'm pushing down the just the quality of the internet video. So, But uh, if we can see that, uh, we, I'm going to stop the video in a moment so you can see. But I'm cleaning towards the cavernous sinus, and uh, we know that we're going to go to the top, to the spear compartment. So can you stop the video right there? Right there, right there. Stop, stop. No, oh, no. Play. More forward, 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 forward. Yeah, right. No, play, play. Play, play, play. And then you're going to stop. No. Thank you. And then you see, like, mobilizing the carotid down, if you're early. And then we're going to be trying to get to the roof of the cavernous sinus. And you guys are going to see the roof of the cavernous sinus in a second as we clean with uh, the right there. And if you can stop their video right there, I appreciate that. Just stop the video. Yeah, so here, what you have, what you have is the carotid is here. And then here, all this area is the roof of the cavernous sinus, okay? So we're cleaning towards this space to remove all this tumor. And here's the part of the tumor located posterior to the posterior gene of the cavernous sinus. So you can continue playing the video, please. And we're going to continue removing that. Go ahead. I don't know why it is. Okay. Okay, just play the video there. From there, it's yeah, fine. There, yeah. Perfect. And then you see with uh, just cl cleaning that area uh, with two suctions <laughs> and then using a three millimeters, 45 <laughs> degree curette to remove that uh, component of the tumor. And now working behind the posterior genome, the carotid, inspecting that segment located right posterior to the posterior genome. So how do you know where to go based on the image? So you need to know where your tumor is gonna be located and then you can go ahead and clean all of that. Uh, that's inspecting the right part, trying to see if there is some tumor, if that was indeed just the gland. And then with two suction technique, we're gonna clean all of that to the best of our abilities. And you see that I'm cleaning, I'm cleaning, but basically I cannot see anything that resembles actual tumor, very different consistency. And then I consider that to be the residual pituitary gland. So no need to go crazy, but anyways, I'm not fully convinced. So inspecting, inspecting, inspecting to maximize the resection there. Then now with a 30 degree endoscope, it's you know easier to see the carotid. So you see the carotid here. And once again, the roof of the cavernous sinus here and cleaning and cleaning that to the best of our abilities because we really want to get a, you know, a gross total resection in this case. And then the carotid here, you can see the carotid right in front of us right there cleaning behind the carotid, superior to the carotid, and this is the inferior compartment here. Once again, in that inferior compartment, we just had a small visualization and opening because we didn't feel that a lot of the tumor was located there. If it was, we'd have to change our approach a bit as I described a bit before. Perfect. And then the reconstruction, we didn't have a leak, so we just used gel phone and, and uh, you see this uh, Duras Institute called Biodesign and we placed it on lay, uh, placed some glue, and, uh, and then that was it. So let's see what happened afterwards. And then uh, we're going to move quickly to try to get yeah. uh, Carlos as well. Yeah, we have the pathology, Dr. Gentop. Would you like to comment on this? Yes. So this is the first case. Um, this is, uh, was pr um, done at the outside institution. It has a classic appearance of a um, pituitary adenoma, as we've seen multiple times, very monotonous nuclei. Um, and it has that neuroendocrine appearance. If we go to the next slide. Um, this is the current case and has the same appearance as the last time. Uh, there's no mitotic activity and the KI-67 labeling was low. 
Um, if we go to the stains, it stains positive for SF1 and for, or sorry, for SF1 and for FSH. So this is a gonadotroph type pituitary adenoma. Thank you so much, Dr. Gentas. And here uh, we just we have the um, the postoperative, uh, the well, the pre and the postop, just to compare. Um, and we can see uh, the expected post surgical changes after the surgery, and we can see that looks like a cultural resection. The postoperative course of the patient. So the patient did very well. Uh, he got the serial neuro exam with pain management. Uh, he got his postoperative labs and he didn't have any uh, DI and he was in charge on postoperative day one without complications. So then on postoperative eight, uh, endocrinology requests some laboratories. Yeah, the only ones so far that came back were the sodium, which was 137, and then the cortisol was 7.4, but he was asymptomatic, felt well. So he was on fluid restriction and he was relieved of his fluid restriction, but he wasn't showing any signs of adrenal insufficiency at this point. Yeah, thank you. And for the follow-up um, endocrinology, I mean, follow-up on the postoperative day eight, and he and the patient will return on after three months. And then he will come back to neurosurgery with a brain MRI with and without contrast. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, Andrea. Appreciate it. I wonder if any final comments. Uh, otherwise, we're going to move to Carlos uh, so we can, you know, go ahead and have the other case, which is quite interesting as well.